This week, an innocent dance at the local discotheque starts a whirlwind romance that leads to heartbreak, mystery, and violence, all of which is overcome by a loving family, some dumb luck, and one determined mother. Welcome to My Crazy Divorce. I'm a failure as a husband. I'm a failure as a man. It's just, I'm beautiful and I'm bright and I deserve better. It's a great day, I'm feeling good, oh, the possibilities of what I could, oh, do with the world at my fingertips, my imagination brings a smile up to my lips. Oh. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of My Crazy Divorce. I'm your host, Tom Milligan. When I first started this show, I interviewed people I already knew from TikTok or even in real life. This week's guest, Deb, is my favorite type of guest because she found us on her own and applied to be a guest on the show's website. I'd never even spoken to her in my life before our interview. And I gotta tell you guys, her story blew me away. Deb's story really gets going in the 1970s at a real life 1970s discotheque. I'm sure a lot of us think times were different back then, and in a lot of ways they were. But I don't think they're as different as you might think. Deb's now in her 60s, and she looks and sounds like just a sweet grandmother, which she is. But don't let her age and appearance fool you. Yeah, I was a naughty girl. Before we get into Deb's story, remember, I'm not an attorney, so nothing in this podcast is even close to legal advice. I'm not a therapist, so please contact a licensed and qualified professional if you find yourself in a crappy marriage or a crazy divorce. Also, I need to warn you that this episode contains descriptions of domestic abuse and violence that might be triggering. So, if you're in a situation that involves domestic violence, please find a way to call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. Don't wait until the next time he hits you. Get help right now. And despite the fact that divorce always sucks, we usually try to have a good time on this show. But bluntly, there's nothing fun or funny about domestic violence. Now, if you like our show, the best thing you can do to help is to give us a five-star rating on whatever app you're using to listen to us right now. That really helps get the word out. And if you have a crazy divorce story and you want to be one of my favorite people, please go to MyCrazyDivorce.com and click on the Apply to Be a Guest button so you can share your story with the world. So let's get into it by learning a little bit about Deb. The story starts in Monroe, Louisiana. My parents were very uh, loving and, and comforting, and I had great parents. I have two older brothers and a younger sister, uh, all of us very, very close. Uh, my brothers and I were all within uh, one brother's 13 months older, another year and a half older than him. So we were all kind of like the three musketeers. Whatever one got into, the others did. You know, it was. We were, we were rough on mom. As the only girl with two older brothers, Deb was just a little spoiled. I had a younger sister who came along seven years later and kind of ruined my whole princess thing. <laughs> so I, I had to adjust. Deb's dad did travel a lot for work, so mom definitely had her hands full raising those four children. They weren't rich, but they were a close-knit family. My dad did everything he could to make sure we all had a summer vacation and we had, you know, everything we needed. It was, there was just a lot of love. That makes a difference. Sounds like a really great family, almost from a Norman Rockwell painting, right? After college, Deb moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma. She got her first real job, her first apartment, and her first car. What a great time of life. I like to go with other girlfriends to the local disco this was many years ago so the local nightclub was a big disco club and we all love to dance and just have a good time it's actually kind of hard to imagine this scene since online dating has taken over but deb was at this club and some guy came over and asked her to dance he just came and asked me to dance and uh and my girlfriends were like yeah 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 go you know go dance with him he's cute you know <laughs> So we, we danced, and I was going to go sit back down because I thought, okay, that was the one dance, you know, that was a fluke. And uh, he he sat down with me and was just, it was like, okay, we dance, you're mine. You know, it was weird. It was weird, but it was exciting to me as a young 20-year-old. 
you're mine. Ugh, that's creepy. But like Deb said, exciting too. He was gorgeous and, and he was attracted to me and I was just so flattered and overwhelmed and he had interest in me and we danced and just had a wonderful night and uh, I gave him my phone number. Yes, kids, that's how we used to do it. He actually gave out our phone number. Well, did he call? No, he didn't call. He came to my door. He just came the very next day, came to my door. Ugh, that sounds extra creepy, right? We, the reason why he knew where my door was because he had followed me home the night before to make sure I got home safely. And, uh, you know, there was the old kiss make out at the door, but I wasn't letting him in at that point. Oh, well, that makes more sense. He didn't just randomly show up, but Deb, making out with this guy after dancing with him just for a little while? Yeah, I was. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so this dude's at her door. I wonder what he wants. He came the very next day and uh, wanted to know, did I want to go, you know, with him to go to the park? So we go and we, we have a good day. It was really nice. I mean, he was just sweet as could be. Seemed like a really nice guy, you know. So who was this guy anyway? That should have been a red flag because I didn't know a lot about Mike. He um, grew up in Colby, Kansas. And uh, which is a very small town, smaller than what my hometown was. And the only reason I know that is because we went there one time to visit an aunt of his. But um, I, I didn't know his father. I don't think he was close to his father. Uh, I never got to meet his mom, but I did meet his brother. And I did get to meet his aunt, and uh, who were just adorable people. Um, I think they were surprised because I don't think they thought we matched which has been another red flag. But, you know, you, you just never know what people expect. Apparently, his father was quite an alcoholic. Now, Mike was quite, uh, he liked to drink. He liked to drink scotch. and But I never knew him to drink to the point where he was, you know, sloshed. And that's all we know at this point. And like Deb said, that's two red flags. Not including the creepy your mind vibe she got that first night. And we're just getting started. Okay, at this point in the story, they've danced one night away, made out at the front door, and spent a lovely day at the park. And remember, that was all in less than 24 hours over a one weekend. But then Monday comes along, and it's time for real life again. I had a job. Uh, I assumed he had a job, and uh, so that was all on a weekend. So Sunday was all in the park, and Monday I had to go to work. Then came Monday night, and he came back. Wow. Mike knows what he wants. So did Deb have an issue with his just showing up? We just kind of fell into each other. I don't, I don't know. It was kind of like I wanted to be with him. He wanted to be with me. I guess not. Sounds like they were both ready for something. I actually had been dating someone before him, and we had broke up. So I was kind of on a rebound and kind of on a, you know, just I just needed somebody, you know. And uh, he filled the, filled the spot. Ugh. Rebounds are the worst. But like most of us, Deb didn't see it at the time. He kept coming back. Every night he would come to see me until the next weekend. And uh, we went out again to the same club because that was like the place to go. And uh, next thing I know, he's wanting to spend the night. He's wanting to stay. And, of course, I wanted him to. <laughs> he, would come, he would come and uh, I would invite him in. We would just sit and talk, watch TV, watch a movie. Um, nothing special. There wasn't any sex in the very beginning. So they're back at the club the next weekend. They've seen each other every day for about a week at this point. By, I want to say that, for sure that next weekend, and I think probably, if, I just can't remember that far back, but I think it was like a day, like on a Thursday or a Friday night, uh, he came and we kind of, that was our first time to really uh, get into each other. And it had kind of, it had been building quite a bit, you know, and, and he was very, um Romantic, very uh, uh, affectionate, and and I like that. Wow, Deb, you are a naughty girl. 
less than two weeks in? You go, girl. My dad would have probably had a heart attack had he known at that point in time that I was seeing this man in my apartment. I can only imagine. And we talked several times. And before I really realized what was going on, he was wanting to move in with me to my apartment. Third red flag. Yeah, I'd say. She's got red flags piling up all over the place. But like most of us, we go colorblind when we're in a relationship. Those red flags sure are easy to spot when it's over, right? Well, Mike and Deb were intimate for the first time on the Thursday or Friday night after they went dancing together at the club. All of a sudden, like not that weekend, we went out again, but the very next weekend, uh, he wanted me to go with him to um, meet his brother. So I was like, okay, who lived in Tulsa as well? So we go to meet his brother, Phil, and uh, uh, had a great visit, his, he and his wife, and um, enjoyed each other, you know, just had a good dinner, laughed, you know. There was nothing said about any kind of issue past-wise. Um, they, were, they were just glad that he had met me and, I, and that I had met him. You know, it was kind of like, Oh, we're so glad he's going to behave kind of feeling, you know. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of like we've been wanting him to find somebody calm, you know. But uh, they didn't know I wasn't calm. Wow. Seems a bit fast to meet the family to me, but maybe that was normal in the 70s. I don't know. I was eight when this was happening. So Deb was done with school, had a job, a car, and a nice apartment. She was independent and on top of the world. The gentleman I had dated before Mike had called me one night. Mike wasn't there. I don't know why we weren't together, but he had called me one night and was wanting to visit, wanting to uh, talk. And, of course, I was kind of devastated because I really kind of started to fall for Mike big time, and I wasn't quite over him, and uh, I had to uh, say no, you know, because... I was afraid what happened previously would happen again. So that broke off. And uh, I don't know. I, I think that kind of triggered me into clinging more to Mike. Does that make sense? It kind of, I don't know. It kind of made me, uh, uh, I went from being fairly independent to a little mousy, a little bit on the um, dependent side if that makes sense. I got to hang on to this guy. I need this guy. It was really strange. Isn't it dumb how we let our significant others change us? And it happens so quickly. A good friend of mine reminded me recently that whatever we allow them to change in the beginning, we allow them to change forever. That's so true. He moved in within, um, it probably was three, close to four weeks into it. Just after meeting him, he moved in. Another red flag. Yeah, yeah. And I should have known that wasn't quite going to work because the only thing he moved in was clothes. You know, there was nothing else came with him. It was just him and some clothes. How many red flags is that? I've lost count. I guess it doesn't really matter at this point. So after just three or four weeks, Mike and his clothes are living in Deb's apartment. Well, fast forward about three months. We were on a date or just driving around, looking, you know, just goofing around. And he said, we're going to go to Miami, Oklahoma. And I'm like, what the heck? I was in Tulsa. I'm like, what the heck is Miami, Oklahoma? Where is it? Why are we going there? And he goes, we're going to get married. Remember that your mind vibe she got on that first night? There was no proposal. No proposal. It was just, it was a combination proposal claiming situation <laughs> you're you're mine i have you i have you in the car and here we go you're mine deb knew it wasn't right but mike could be very persuasive and i was like why well, I, I can't get married because number one my mom and dad are not even in the country right now and my mom would have a heart attack if i got married and she didn't get to plan a wedding so I, I, I don't understand how we come to do that. And, of course, you know, the whole thing was just all so emotional and uh, uh, persuasive on his part. 
that this is what we should do. You know, we really needed to do this. He really loved me. You know, it was, he used that love word a lot. And uh, it, it affects you if you think it's real. And I thought it was real. Yeah, yeah. So three and a half months, we get married. We went to the courthouse, went to the courthouse, had our driver's license. I, I don't know what the deal is with Oklahoma and Louisiana. You have to have a license and you have to do all that. But they did it all right then and there. Wedding days are supposed to include a white dress, family, parties, fun. But this was just Mike and Deb in a courthouse in Miami, Oklahoma. Even if this marriage worked out, which we all know it won't, there's no way to have fond memories of your wedding day from Miami, Oklahoma. And if the wedding day isn't great, at least they could have a nice wedding night together, right? The night we got back, I got another phone call from the person I had previously dated, more seriously wanting to get back together. And it was, I don't know, my heart kind of dropped and I, I kind of realized I had really done something dumb. And uh, that maybe I wasn't really in love with this guy. Maybe I was replacing. Maybe he was somebody to just fill the spot. And I just didn't know what I wanted. You know, I was just being restless or stupid or whatever. You know, it just it, it, I knew right then my heart dropped. I knew right then I had I had really messed up. So she knew it was wrong earlier in the day. But. Reality is really setting in. That was my wedding night, yeah. And uh, it was just heartbreaking because then I was like, okay, how do I get out of this? You know, what? this is wrong. This is not going to work. I, I, I see now my eyes were starting to open to things that were just not developing like they should have. You know, it, it, there was nothing normal or or typical like most uh, engagements, weddings, promises, those kind of things. Nothing, none of that was working. And uh, I was starting to really realize I had, you know, maybe fallen into something I didn't need to be in. So in just three and a half months, Deb went from being on top of the world to becoming mousy and dependent on Mike and then being coerced into a marriage she didn't want and wasn't ready for. That's just heartbreaking. We had spikes of happiness, you know, but but... Not, not like it should have been. Like my, my, one of my brothers got married. Uh, we came back to Monroe for the wedding and, uh, neither of my brothers cared for him. They all picked up on him quick, you know, that this is not, this guy's not quite what we think he is, or this is not who you think he is. That's what they would tell me. It would have been so easy at this point to just give up. I was I was dedicated. I mean, I knew I had messed up, but I was still thinking, okay, you're here. You got to make the best of it. You know, you just don't give up. You got maybe you're just looking at it wrong. You got to give it a chance. You got to work on it. So I really, I, I was. I don't want it to sound like I gave up, and I just wanted to. I did say I, I wanted to get out, and I did in the back of my mind, but I didn't want to just totally give up without at least trying. Deb's a fighter for sure. So how did that work out? It was downhill from there. Seriously? How much worse could it get? Well, much worse as it turns out. One evening, after they'd been married for about five months, Mike and Deb went out to dinner with some of his friends. Somehow Mike got the idea in his head that Deb was flirting with one of his friends. So he confronted her on the way to the car. We walked out into the parking lot, got in the car. I was putting on my seatbelt, and I was like, I don't understand. I just started to ask him a question, like, I don't understand what's wrong. And he backhanded me with a closed fist right up beside my face. And I, it just literally took me out for a second. I, I was just totally dazed, totally dazed. And I opened my car door, got out started walking off like I thought I knew where I was going. I really didn't know where I was walking to. And he starts the car up and starts chasing after me. You know, you need to get back in the car. You don't know where you're going. It was just, low, you know, a big old argument going on. As I'm walking away, finally it dawns on me, oh, I can't walk wherever I'm going. I don't really want to get back in this car, but it's my freaking car 
to start with, and I'll be darned if you're going to drive off with my car and I'm going to walk somewhere. So I get back in the car thinking, I don't know what, you know, but I get back in the car and we go home and he apologizes all the way home. You know, you just really upset me. I don't understand why you had to flirt with so-and-so, you know, it just, I, I, I don't understand why you do that to me. And it was always why I did that to him. Why did I always make him feel bad? Why did I always do things to make him uncomfortable? That kind of, you know, he turned everything around to where I was always the bad guy. Never admitting that he's the one not pulling his on. You know, not he's the one not behaving. He's the one not acting like he should. A good, loving husband. What a complete asshole. That was the first time he ever hit me. Did she just say first time? Please tell me she left at the first sign of domestic violence. Well, I found out shortly after I was pregnant. You know, I didn't even think of that as an abusive relationship. I thought of that as, oh my God, what did I do? And why did he hit me? And oh, I hope he doesn't ever hit me again. It didn't dawn on me. You know, he probably will. It just, it just didn't. I was, I was just like so taken aback by it that I just thought, oh, you know, I guess that's just a reaction that he had and I'll get over it. Hey guys, I admit, I actually cried at this point of the interview. I mean, seriously, why does this happen? Ladies, please don't put up with any domestic violence. Not once. Leave. If there's a first time, there will always be a second time. Men, don't hit women. Only a coward would hit a woman. Don't be a coward. And if you think it's okay to hit a woman, please stop listening to our show right now. I don't want you here. I was amazed at Deb's candor and strength, so I commented on it. Oh, it was heartbreaking. when it, I mean, when it happened, I was miserable. I cried all the time. I couldn't really go to my mom and cry because she didn't understand why I was, I mean, she's like you, she didn't understand why I was dealing with it. Why you put up with this? You know, because I was not me. I was, I had become very submissive, very, very mousy, very, you know, whatever you want, you know, just whatever, whatever we need to do. So here's this guy she doesn't really know with a sketchy background and no regular job. And then we have Deb who just eight or nine months earlier just wanted to go dancing with her friends, but instead is getting punched in the face and giving in to this douchebag. Tragic. She wanted to leave, but in addition to being pregnant, there were some other challenges she had to overcome. I was afraid to admit to family, you know, which I'm, I, I should have known they would have known, and there's no way they would have in any way hesitated for me to come back home. Actually, my dad would have probably gone berserk, but um, I just didn't want to admit it. I, I didn't want to admit failure. You know? <laughs> I mean, I had I had brothers and a sister who were all married and happy. And uh, I didn't want to be the one who wasn't. This made me cry all over again. She stayed for everyone but herself. I lost my, my my very first car I had ever bought. I lost it because it got repossessed because he spent all our money. I lost the, my very first apartment I'd ever had. Uh, I ended up even losing my first job. But I constantly went to um, another job, you know, and uh, tried to do my best. But he would show up and just act out and cause all kind of problems. Until right now. The ex-spouse I hated the worst from our show was Erin, JD's ex from the brilliant Wicked Evil episode. She's now in second place behind this waste of skin. So just a little while after that first punch, Deb tells Mike she's pregnant. Oh, he was so happy. We were going to have a baby. He was so happy. I remember we went over to my parents' house to uh, let my parents know. <clears throat> and uh, he was standing in the kitchen with my dad. He was just so excited, and my dad was trying to find out what his plan was. You know, what are you, what are y'all going to do? Um, how are you going to raise a child? You know, you're you're not really stable right now. You don't see where you, you guys are ready. You know, to have a child. You know, what's the plan? And he was, oh, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I, you know, I got this all taken care of. You know, you don't have to worry about this. Um, 
and uh, I, I could see in my dad's eyes, you know, oh my God, I'm going to have to bail her out. And uh, I'm sure that's what he was thinking the whole time. And uh, my mom was happy, and but guarded. You know, she was happy, but I think she was worried. What a dick. How could he stand there looking Deb's dad in the eye, knowing he'd punched her in the face just a little while before? Where are we on the red flag count? So Deb continues working. But what did Mike do for work? He was always gone. Like, he would go like he had a job. You know, he would he would be gone during the day. I had no idea where he was going or what he was doing. He always told me he was working at a bar. And uh, I, I didn't know what bar or what exactly he was doing other than bartending. God, I hate this guy. And Deb is smart. He must have been such a charmer. I come home one evening or one afternoon from work, and he is, uh, there, he's not there, but there's someone else's clothes there. And it wasn't, it was a female. It was someone else's, it was not my clothes. It was somebody else's clothes. And I was like, okay, I don't know what's going on here. I'm showing already. And, uh, kind of feeling a little uncomfortable about the whole thing, not knowing quite what's right. And then he t when he comes in, I'm like, okay, what's going on? Whose clothes are these? What's, what's the deal? We get into a big fight, big argument. He says it's a cousin that had come to visit, and they had gone swimming. We did have a swimming pool in that apartment complex. But they had just gone swimming. I guess she just forgot her clothes. This sucks. My ex would have just gotten mad at me for going through her things. At least Mike had an excuse made up even if it sucked. So did Deb buy that line about it being his cousin's clothing? I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, but I'm still in the back of my mind not quite convinced. You know, it's like, it's like you have to see somebody cheat to really believe they cheated. I, 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 you know, why would somebody go to all the trouble to marry you and, and put up with you while you're pregnant if they don't really love you, right? Why, Deb? Why? He doesn't deserve your love, your trust, or even the benefit of the doubt. And frankly, Mike didn't like that she had doubts. He gets mad. He leaves, goes somewhere. I'm sure probably can visit his cousin. And uh, <laughs> I, I go to sleep, you know, crying. And that was it. Periodically, weird things would happen that kind of made me wonder, was he cheating? Was something going on? I mean, I really kind of thought he was in the back of my mind. You know, but <clears throat> I didn't have any proof. Well, Deb, where there's smoke, there's fire. You know, according to Benjamin Franklin, nothing is certain but death and taxes. Well, if he saw the divorce rate in our country, he'd probably add that to the list, too. But speaking of taxes, I'm old enough to remember life before you could do your taxes online. We had two options way back then. Do it yourself or hire an accountant. Now, most of us didn't really need an accountant, but we weren't comfortable doing our own taxes, so we hired an accountant. What a waste. The sad thing is that until now, divorce had those exact same options. You could do your own divorce, or you could hire an attorney. Most divorcing couples don't really need an attorney, but they're not comfortable doing their own divorce, so they end up hiring attorneys. What a waste. But that's all in the past. OurDivorce.com has brought the divorce process out of the dark ages and into the light. Just go to OurDivorce.com and click on Get Started. It costs you nothing unless the process works for you. And even then, it's only $299. So you really have nothing to lose. But if you think an attorney is the best option, get up out of your Barca lounger, pause Matlock on your VCR, get that sweet flip phone out of your fanny pack, and give them a call. I suggest you check your bank balance first, though, because it's going to cost you. Either way, I hope you're enjoying the show. When I was actually due, it was time for me to have Chris, but um, he it was not, you know, I wasn't having any kind of labor pains or anything, but we'd had a big argument, and I was going down the stairs to leave. I was going to my parents' house. I had had enough. I was done. I was like, okay, this is the last straw. I'm halfway down the stairs, and I go into labor. I turn around and go back up the stairs, 
thinking, okay, I don't know how I'm going to get to the hospital. I'm going to have to uh, ask him to take me to the hospital as mad as I am, you know? And I'm, I'm like, Mike, I, we got to go to the hospital. And he's just falling all over himself. Oh, uh, okay. You know, oh, I love you, baby. We're, we're going to go. I'll, I'll get the car. Of course. He knows how to play the game. So I'm thinking on the way to the hospital, oh, well, maybe he really does love me. Maybe, maybe he's just having a hard time accepting that he's going to be a father. Oh, hell no. Why would she think that? He was not one to talk, you know, to sit and just communicate how you're feeling. You know, what, what do you think about all this? You know, we never had those kind of conversations, you know. <clears throat> I was always yakking, but I never remember hearing him really tell me how he was feeling about everything. Damn it, Deb. In early August, Deb gave birth to a strong, healthy baby boy. Parental leave wasn't a thing back then, so Deb had to go back to work after just a day or two in order to keep her job. Now let's fast forward. We're going three weeks into the future. It's now Thursday, August 24th, just a few days before Mike's birthday on August 28th. Remember that date. Monday, August 28th, Mike's birthday. He had gone to work on Thursday, didn't come home. Didn't come home on Friday. Didn't see him or hear from him on Saturday. I call my mom and dad and I'm like, okay, this is not working. I don't know what to do. Mom's like, you need to come here. So my dad comes and gets me. Gets, you know, we get Chris. We go back to my parents' house. <clears throat> my mom and dad are telling me, you know, you don't have to stay married if this is not working. You know, just because just because you have Chris now, you don't have to put up with all this. And maybe this is not the best thing. Finally. I've said it before, but the biggest mistake I made after my ex-wife's first affair was not telling anyone. After her second affair, I made sure to talk with my family and my friends because I needed moral support. And it made all the difference. For now, Deb and Chris are safe with her parents in Monroe, Louisiana about eight hours from Tulsa. But do you think Mike's going to just sit back and let it go? Of course not. I'm at my parents' house, you know, and so Mike calls me on Monday morning at my parents' house. We didn't have cell phones back there in either, by the way. He calls me on the phone, you know, what are you doing? When are you coming home? What's going on? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I'm not coming home. I'm, I'm not coming back. You know, this is it. We're done. There's no way. I'm not giving you a divorce. You're not keeping my son. Blah, blah. All of a sudden, it's my son, and I'm, you know, he's going to be real possessive about it and just be very uh, aggressive on the phone. I'm like, no, no, I'm not, com I'm not coming back. And uh, he's like, that's okay. He said, I'll fix that. You're not, you're not keeping my son. And I said, okay, and he hung up. I think I got maybe two more phone calls from him about how you're, you know, I'm not um, – not giving you a divorce, you know, this is not going to happen. You know, I, I want my son. Well, he knew he couldn't come and visit at my house because he knew my dad wouldn't let him in the door. But still, <clears throat> there was a lot of conversation, a lot of phone calls. He's working her, but she's hanging tough. I'm sure her parents were just so relieved to have her home. Well, it's thanks around Thanksgiving because I remember it was uh, my parents had gone to a Thanksgiving party with some friends of theirs, and it was just me and my younger sister at the house, and Chris, my son, who was just a little one, and uh, I got a phone call from him. He wanted to send me, a, he was just begging me to come back. He wanted to send me a plane ticket to come back, that he had got a place for us to live. Not gonna lie, I don't like where this is heading at all. So, me, in my ultimate wisdom, decided that this was a good idea and I called a cab I packed as much of my son's stuff and my stuff in a box and away we went to the airport got on a plane and went to Tulsa Oklahoma to meet my husband and some female that I did not know standing beside him oh no maybe she's the cousin she was his ex-wife and we were going to stay with her at her house until we could get a place. This is how I found out he had an ex-wife. 
Awkward. Wow. So Deb had just dropped everything and flew to Tulsa. She couldn't just turn around and leave. She's kind of trapped. But even worse, she's trapped living with Mike's ex-wife that she didn't even know existed until right now. What more is this guy hiding? I was furious. Um, beyond mad. He was elated because he was holding his son and I was scared and didn't know what to do. She was as nice, as sweet a person as you can imagine, considering the situation. She was well aware of what's going on. She had been talking to him all along. She knew exactly what he was doing. She's the one that was talking him into getting me to come back because she thought we could make a go of it. And she literally just wanted to help. She was just being a sweet person to try to help him right his ways in other ways. Um, there was still no love loss with them. I mean, they, there was no attachment for them. She was done with him. He was done with her. They were just good friends. Uh, she was a super nice lady and uh, ended up being a really good friend of mine. That's good. At this point, I'm sure Deb could really use a friend. So she grudgingly moves in with Mike and his ex-wife, Elaine. And things are okay for about a week. I think I had been there maybe a week. Maybe not, not, maybe not quite a week. And uh, there was a knock on the door. I remember Chris was in a playpen because we didn't have a crib. He, I just had a playpen to put him in. And I was in the living room. Mike was fixing something in the house, and uh, Elaine, who was his ex, was in the kitchen. She was cooking supper. I was mess dealing with Chris, and someone knocked on the door. So I go to the door, open the door, and there's a woman standing there. <clears throat> she goes, uh, is Mike here? And I said, yeah. And uh, she's like, well, I need to see him. And I said, well why do you need to see him? I'm his wife. You know, do you, is there something I can help you with? And she goes, well, if you're his wife, then you married my husband. What? Deb married someone else's husband? I was shocked. I just stood there. I said, I just screamed for him. You need to come here right now. He came running into the living room and just stopped, dead stop. Busted. I looked at him and I looked at her. I said, I don't know who you are. I don't know when you got married. She said, we got married on August 28th. Remember that date? That was Mike's birthday. That was the weekend he didn't come home. So Deb left to be with her parents. He is such a dick. And that date blew up in my head. That was the very same day he called me at my parents' house to tell me he was not going to give me a divorce. And that was the day they got married. I said, ma'am, I don't know what you're thinking, but you married my husband. But you know what? There that SOB is, and you can have him. And I turned around and looked at my, I said, you need to get the heck out of this house now. He goes, it's okay. It's okay. I can explain. I can explain. And I'm like, no, you can't explain this. I would love to hear his explanation, wouldn't you? But Deb didn't give him a chance to explain. And so he goes outside. They're talking outside. He's trying to calm her down. Elaine's trying to console me. Uh, Chris is crying at this point. It's just a big cluster. And... Uh, I told Elaine, I said, oh, oh no, I'm, I can't stay here. I don't know where I'm going to go. I totally freaked out, grabbed my son, wrapped him up in a blanket, and went outside like I was going to walk off in the snow by myself in the night. Lord knows where I thought I was going to go. I can totally picture the scene. Total chaos, right? He made her leave, and he was like, you got to come back in the house. You know, you're going to die. You're going to give the kids sick, blah, blah, blah. So we go back in the house, and uh, we decide, okay, he needs to leave. I'm going to stay here with Elaine. We're going to have to sort something out tomorrow. So he leaves with her. I stay in the house. Kicking him out makes sense. I think Deb's finally had it. 
But what the hell is his new wife thinking? Why did she let him go with her? I guess that's her problem. I know I'm number two. That makes this girl number three. I'm like, but not really, because I was already there first, so you don't count. I, I was totally shocked. I was thinking, okay, Elaine's number one, I'm number two, he's all mine, but there's a number three. Where is it going to go from here? Exactly. Who knows what else is going on with this guy? Despite the awkwardness of living with Mike's ex, Deb really didn't have much of a choice. Elaine knew somebody who knew somebody, and helped Deb get a job as a secretary. And she helped take care of Chris, the, the baby, whenever she could. But Deb was starting from scratch. She didn't have a car, she didn't have her own place, and she could hardly feed her son. So she actually had to rely on others for transportation to and from work. Mike was wanting to try to do the right thing and make sure I, I was, he helped me out as much as possible. So he would give me a ride to work on occasion if Elaine couldn't which was embar uh, just totally unbearable. Uh, it, w it was the hardest thing I ever did was to ride in the car with him at any point in time at that point. Through a lot of hard work and determination, Deb was able to get on her feet. She got her own place, and she pulled things together. But why didn't she just call her parents for help? I don't know why I didn't think I could go back home, because number one, I didn't have a way to get back home. Uh, number two, I was too embarrassed to go back home. Uh, number three, I was pissed and determined to survive and i think the feeling of being mad is what actually pulled me through with everything with everything because had i not been as mad as i was i think i would have probably really failed big time failed meaning um no telling what would have ended up with me uh but uh but i struggled i had struggled i went to work every day i did what i had to do you know, you, you survive. I love Deb. She's such a fighter. Then one night, Mike shows up at her door. Mike comes uh, to the door. She, Judy is in the car. And uh, he has some papers he wants me to fill out so we can get a divorce. I said, okay. But in that divorce, he wanted Chris. I was like, oh, but hell no, uh-uh, you are not getting my son, that's not going to happen, no, um, I'll divorce you in a heartbeat, that's no problem, but you, you're not getting Chris. So we argue and argue, and he leaves, uh, so he comes back another day, it was just over a series of probably a week, back and forth, back and forth, arguing about this divorce, I said, you know, no, it's just not going to happen. And uh, every time he would come back, he would be more and more upset, more and more mad, uh, more and more aggressive, that kind of thing. Remember, this is the coward who punched her in the face a few years earlier. She had to be terrified, but she stood her ground. A little while later, she gets a call at work from Mike's brother, Phil. He was checking on her and Chris and really wanted to see if they could help. They had heard, you know, about what was going on, but he had not really been communicating with his family, so they didn't know a lot of this. Um, so I had met them for dinner at their house, and <clears throat> we had a good conversation. And uh, they told me that they were really worried when we first got married because he was not a stable guy. He had had a lot of issues in his past, and, you know, that they were not surprised that it failed, but they were glad that I was okay, and they wanted to do whatever they could do to help. You know, they just wanted to know that there, that I wasn't alone, you know, kind of thing. So that was really comforting. And they, um, uh, Phil had brought me back to the apartment. I, I, we went to bed, put Chris to bed. You know, I went to bed. I have to admit. As Deb told that part of the story, I kind of expected Mike to show up at Phil's house and just try to take Chris. Turns out, Phil's really a good guy who probably knows his brother's a waste of space. After Phil dropped her off, she put Chris to bed and went to sleep, feeling pretty good that she'd come so far and now had Phil in her corner. About three o'clock in the morning, my door to the apartment comes off the hinges, literally into the apartment. Mike is totally blitzed out, in a huge rage, drags me off the bed, throws me on the floor, 
beats the ever loving whatever out of me. I'm near passing out. He's trying to smother me with a pillow. <clears throat> Chris is standing in the bed screaming. Holy crap. I will never understand such cowardly rage. But given what we already know about this douche, I can't say that I'm really surprised he lost it. He's just that type of guy. But Deb's luck hadn't run out entirely. My next door neighbor is coming home. From being out. And he pulls Mike off of me. And they, uh, there's another guy out there and they call the police and it, it ends up a big thing. Um, I survive. And he gets arrested. He goes to jail. For the time being. I, uh, am okay. I'm, I'm not dead. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm not in good shape. But, you know, you, you just think, what the hell? You know, it was that quick. I mean, that quick. And you just, you don't know what to do. Thank God for the neighbor, right? Despite the beating, Deb had to work to survive. So just two days after she was beaten half to death, she goes back to work. I still have a lot of bruising on me. <clears throat> the girl that sits next to me where I work... <clears throat> has kind of become a bit of a friend. And we were in the bathroom talking, and she noticed some of the bruising. She's like, what in the world happened to you? And I just kind of told her what had happened. She was like, oh, my God, you know, that's terrible. You know, you got to get away. You, you don't need to be around this guy, you know. And I'm like, well, I'm trying to get away from him, but, you know, it's not that easy, and we have a good conversation. That's it. Sometimes it just feels good to share what's happening with a friend, right? Not too long after that bathroom counseling session with her friend, Deb's back at her desk. My boss, my immediate supervisor, <clears throat> calls me into his office. And he goes, um, I just wanted you to know that I'm fixing to have to go to a meeting. I'm going to be gone for about maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes. If you need to make a phone call, I had no idea he don't. She had gone to him and talked to him. If you need to make a phone call to somebody, like maybe your parents, feel free to use my phone. Wow. That's really amazing. She really had some good people looking out for her. So I call my dad. And he's in uh, at my apartment within eight hours. He has a 45 on his hip and ready to do some damage if needed. Perfect. There was never any doubt that her parents would have supported her, and I'm so glad she finally called him. We packed what, what little bit I have, you know, in the car. The man who owned the uh, little apartment strip where we were staying came to me, handed me an envelope that had my last month's rent to give it back to me. Just to tell me how glad he was that I was going home. Seriously, such amazing people helping Deb. She and her dad made the eight-hour drive back to Monroe. Deb knows she's starting over again, but this time she has her family's support. I know Deb said Elaine has been a good friend, but I'm still not sure about her. I said, well, she said, you know, the whole thing about this Judy girl, I don't understand this because, you know, you're like his 12th wife. What? Did she just say 12th wife? And I said, what? And she said, yeah. She said, I was, I was his 11th marriage. I said, Elaine, you got to be kidding me. There's nobody gets married that many times. That's ridiculous. That's illegal. You can't do that. And she goes, yeah, it is illegal. It's, it's not right. And, and, you know, this is all coming to light. People don't know this. You know, there are other girls that I've been talking to and we're all ready to do whatever we can to make sure he stays in jail for a while. Twelfth wife? I said, well, you know, Elaine, it would have been nice if I'd have known this way back when, you know, like when we first got married, if you would have said something. I didn't even know you. I didn't know you existed. I didn't know any of this. I was totally blindsided by the whole thing. Seriously? 
What the hell, Elaine? <sighs> Mike's been a year in jail, which is not nearly enough. He tried to call Deb a couple of times, and he sent her a couple of letters. Now, she didn't accept the calls or open the letters, but he did try to contact her. While he was in jail, Deb was actually able to get a quick and simple divorce. They had no assets to speak of, and custody and visitation with Chris weren't an issue, so the divorce went without a hitch and cost almost nothing. Yeah, I know, this is supposed to be a story about a crazy divorce. But sometimes the experience surrounding the divorce is the crazy part. So anyway, fast forward a couple of years. Chris is about four. Deb had a good job and had found a nice little house for the two of them. Was, you know, moving on with my life. And I knock on the door and there he stood. In Monroe. This guy. Does it make you wonder if he ever stalked the other 12 wives like this? I, I uh, looked at him. <clears throat> he said, I need to see my son. I said, you don't have a son here. You need to leave. And I shut the door. I can imagine the look in her eyes when he showed up. I can picture him seeing the fury of Mama Bear and realizing he'd lost any chance with her or with his son and just kind of slinking off into the night like the coward that he is. Never to be heard from again, right? Chris is 10 years old. I'm in the bathtub. The phone rings. Chris comes running in, knocking on the door. Mama, there's somebody on the phone. I said, well, baby, just tell him, you know, I, I'll be with him in a minute. I'll call him back, take a number. He said, it's some man, and he keeps calling me his boy. I said, S well, I said, what? And he said, yeah. He said, it's some man. He said, he keeps calling me his boy. I said, baby, just hang up the phone. So he, he goes back, and he hangs up the phone. <laughs> phone rings again. Chris answered it. He goes, mama, he's just hollering, you know, in the apartment. Mama, it's that same man. I said, baby, hang up the phone, and then you know where the plug is in the wall? Unplug it. So he unplugs it. From there on, I never have heard anything else from him. Ever since. Never. I asked whatever became of Mike. As far as I know, he is still with number 13. I really don't know. I don't even know if he's still alive, to be honest with you. We've had no contact whatsoever. Obviously, no contact is the right strategy in this situation. I asked if Chris, now a man in his mid-40s, has any relationship with Mike. He wouldn't know him if he walked up and said hello. I, and, I, I, you know, maybe that was wrong, but I kind of feel like it was probably best for him to not know. Deb also informed me that she'd actually never shared this story with her son. I suggested she tell him the story before this episode drops. She said she would. So, Chris... If you're listening to this, you have an amazing mother, and I'm honored to have helped her share your story. I hope it helps someone in a similar situation. As we're winding down the interview, Deb told me that even 45 years after they met, even though she's sure he was working an angle, she can't figure out what the angle was. I don't know what he was hoping for. I, I, don't, I don't know what he thought he was going to get from me, because I wasn't. I wasn't somebody who had anything of wealth or anything advantage-wise other than I had an apartment and I had a car. And for him, I guess that was all he needed at that point in time. Oh, God. It took me forever to get over Mike. I don't know why it took me so long. I was scared. I was scared to trust anybody. Several years later, Deb remarried. Chris and his stepdad were close, but the marriage didn't last, and Deb was single again. I ended up... Becoming my real person after all that, I, I uh, ended up living. I moved with my parents after uh, my second divorce. My dad got transferred to Canada, to uh, Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, it was just me and Chris, my son and I, and my dad talked us into going. So we ended up getting a visa and going to Canada. We lived there. I worked at a hospital there for a little while. And... Uh, when we, while we were there, I needed a, some kind of activity for Chris to be involved in because he was new and young. He was only in fourth grade, so he needed to have some, uh, uh, some way to interact with the other kids, you know. So uh, we ended up going to a karate class, and so Chris took the karate, and I met the sensei, and he was super nice. We we had a great relationship. Um, 
ended up uh, coming, when we came back home, my dad was transferred back. And of course we left, we could only stay there for so long, you know, and you have to come back. And uh, I, he wanted to stay in karate. So we joined another karate group here in, in Monroe. And uh, the I, as a mom, along with the other moms, would sit in the back of the class and uh, knit <laughs> while the kids were doing their class, you know. And uh, the, one day the sensei, Mark, I'll never forget, he was such a sweet guy. He's like, okay, you moms back there, all the talking and everything, y'all need to get up here and try to do some of this. It's be good for y'all, you know, it'd be good exercise. And we were like, yeah, right. But we took the challenge and we thought, well, well, you know, we can show the kids we can do this. You know, we can try. And uh, we got hooked. And I ended up taking karate for Taekwondo for 15 years. Ended up, yeah, ended up with my black belt. Uh, we went to many, many tournaments on the weekend and just had the time of our lives. My son is my heart. See what I mean? Deb's a fighter. And a black belt in karate. And she adores her son. I really admire her. Obviously, being wife number 12 is not normal, especially when you're under the impression that you're wife number one. But I asked Deb what advice she'd offer to our listeners. Take your time. Take your time getting to know that person. Um, find out about them. You know, and I hate to say investigate. That just seems so harsh. But you really need to know the person. You need to know their family. You need to know how uh, things about them, uh, what they like, what they look like in their past, how they dealt with things as a child, as a young person, as a teenager, as a young adult. You just need to really know the person. Don't just go willy nilly into something. Don't don't go blind. Um, don't lead with your heart. She's truly amazing. Words cannot express the gratitude, admiration, and appreciation I feel towards Deb and to Chris. What a story. As I said before, men don't hit women. Women don't allow men to hit you. Get help. Find shelter. And do not make excuses for their cowardly acts. That's our show for this week. As I've always said, ratings and reviews are the currency of the podcast world. So if you like this week's story, the best thing you can do is give us five stars on whatever app you're using right now to listen to this episode. If you've already given us a five-star rating, please take a minute just right now to share the show with a friend. If you'd like to share your crazy divorce story on our show, go to MyCrazyDivorce.com and click on the Apply to Be a Guest button at the bottom of the page. I would really love to hear from you. See you next week, everybody. Imagination brings a smile of